All right. Okay, so uh, thanks everybody for coming. And I'll just give a very brief introduction to the event to explain some of the genesis of it, how it <coughs> links into this broader project that I'm doing, and then introduce the main topics for the discussion for the day. So this particular workshop is taking part, uh, taking place as part of this project I'm doing called the Algocracy and Transhumanist Project. It actually has a much longer title, the official title, but I've abbreviated it more and more over time to just these two things, which, as you can see from the subheading here, is supposed to be about the future of governance and values in a post-human era. So the origin of this project came from an article that I read a few years ago by a guy called Evgeny Moratsov in the MIT Technology Review. The article was titled The Real Privacy Problem. It was written primarily as a response to the Edward Snowden leak and the widespread discussion about privacy and the consequences of, of mass surveillance. But what struck me about this particular article was that even though it was titled The Real Privacy Problem, it had nothing really to do with privacy at all. That wasn't the primary focus of it. It was mainly concerned with the impact of big data, predictive analytics, uh, descriptive analytics on political processes and how we conceive and operate as citizens within a democratic state. And there are a couple of quotes from the article that struck me in particular that can summed up this ethos or focus. I'll just show you a couple of those. Throughout the article, Moritzoff uses this metaphor or idea of barbed wire and explaining how the technological infrastructures that we're creating are a form of invisible barbed wire around our lives. So for example, he says that the, the construction of what I call invisible barbed wire around our intellectual and social lives, big data with its many interconnected databases that feed in information and algorithms of dubious provenance imposes severe constraints on how we mature politically and socially. The invisible barbed wire of big data limits our lives to a space that might look quiet and enticing enough, but is not of our own choosing and that we cannot rebuild or expand. The worst part is that we do not see it as such because we believe that we are free to go anywhere. The barbed wire remains invisible. So what he's discussing at this point in the article is just the way in which various algorithms feed us options or choices. You're probably familiar with this from things like Amazon or Netflix where they recommend op options to you and his claims that the same uh, algorithmic logic or ethos is feeding into other areas of social life and governance. And the last quote that he, I'm taking from the article, which is particularly apt, I think, for today's discussion, kind of drives this point home. He says, thanks to smartphones or Google Glass, we can now be pinged whenever we are about to do something stupid, unhealthy, or unsound. We wouldn't necessarily need to know why the action would be wrong. The system's algorithms do the moral calculus on their own, and citizens take on the role of information machines that feed the techno-bureaucratic complex with our data. And why wouldn't we if we are promised slimmer waistlines, cleaner air, or longer and safer lives in return? So this uh, idea kind of captured me, and I subsequently wrote a piece about it called The Threat of Algocracy, which was about, it was a taken from a, an idea in political philosophy and an article titled The Threat of Epistocracy, which is about the way in which epistemic elites take over political life and political governance, and they deny opportunities for democratic participation in the citizenry as a whole. And the argument that I made is that the same is true when algorithms take over governance processes, that they are a kind of new epistemic elite, the algorithms themselves, those uh, techno-bureaucratic complexes, as as uh, Moratsov says. So when I wrote this piece originally, I thought I was being very clever with this word, algocracy, but I, I'd invented a new term. Turns out I was wrong. I didn't invent that term at all. Um, <coughs> sorry, I actually skipped this. So the inventor of the term was this guy, uh, A. Anish, who wrote a PhD thesis about this, actually, in the early 2000s, 2001, and contacted me to inform me that he invented the, the term. <laughs> um, and in his PhD thesis, he, and some books that he wrote subsequently, he was interested in three different kinds of governance structure that operate in human life. Markets, which he said, markets try and manipulate and control how we behave through prices. 
they are the focal point to that structure and control behavior. Bureaucracies try to do this through rules and regulations. And then he argued for a new type of governance structure, an algocracy, in which computer code structures and constrains behavior. And these three things can operate in unison or together. There can be interesting overlaps between market-based governance and algocratic governance and bureaucratic governance and algocratic governance. But he thinks that conceptually, anyway, you can distinguish between these three modes of governance. Now, his main field of interest is actually in um, migration studies and in how people contribute to a global economy. And he wrote a book called Virtual Migration, which is about how algocratic governance systems allow people in remote locations to contribute to a global economy. But one thing that uh, struck me about this tripartite distinction between governance structures is that there's also a corresponding governance subject. There are presuppositions about the, the people that you're trying to control or govern. So roughly, with a market, you have some kind of economic subject, a rational utility maximizer, for example. With a bureaucratic subject, you're assuming some sort of rational, reflective, and conscious agent who understands and interprets rules. And the question is, what happens with an algocracy? <coughs> what kind of algocratic subject is presumed? What assumptions are we making about human behavior? Is it like a rational utility style assumption, or is it something new and different? And that was really then the impetus for this project that uh, would explore the development of algocratic governance structures and the creation of new algocratic governance subjects. So there are three main questions that um, guided this project. One is what, what kinds of structures are being created? Second is how do humans relate to these structures? What kind of rights of participation or involvement do they have in relation to these structures? And then finally, what consequences does this have for humanity, for how we understand ourselves or interpret ourselves? And there seemed to be a spectrum of, of responses or possibilities here. Some people viewed the development of these new techno-bureaucratic complexes as deeply dehumanizing. It's kind of contrary to the humanist ethos of the Enlightenment, some people argue. Or in, and some people have a more positive outlook on it, that it's uh, transhumanizing, it's uh, allowing us to enhance or improve ourselves to become better beings. So that's the, the project as a whole. For this particular event, the focus is really on a particular air, a part of the algocratic governance, which is mainly expressed through this quantified self movement, uh, which was, I mean, quantification of data, tracking of your personal data, has been a phenomenon for a very long time, but the quantified self movement itself can be traced back to 2008. It was invented by these two guys, Gary Wolf on the left and Kevin Kelly on the right. They're both you know, Silicon Valley mavens or digital journalists. Uh, Kevin Kelly was one of the founding editors of a magazine called Wired, which is, builds itself as the magazine of digital culture. So they started this movement, the Quantified Self Meetup. They have a web page. This is their slogan, self-knowledge through numbers. It, by tracking and quantifying personal data, you can enhance your autonomy, fulfill more goals, become fitter, healthier, happier, more productive. I think it's a song, I think. Just to give you an example of some of the language that they use to describe this movement from Kevin Kelly, I thought this was quite apt for today's conversation. Quantifying yourself is an act of self-assertion. It's not narcissistic ad adoration of the self, but rather self-definition in an age of great uncertainty about who we are. So that's really what I want to explore in this workshop, and I'm hoping the speakers we've assembled will explore, is the consequences of the quantified self movement for governance and for self-understanding. So really, um, yeah, another quote from Deborah Lupton, who's written this book on the quantified self, which struck me and that gave me the title for this event was that the use of these quantified self technologies configure a certain type of approach to understanding and experiencing one's body, an algorithmic subjectivity in which the body and its health states, functions and activities are portrayed and understood predominantly via quantified calculations, predictions and comparisons. It turns out that uh, there's an article called The Algorithmic Self written by a guy called Frank Pasquale, but I, I wasn't aware of that before we decided on the name of this event either. 
even though I, I know Frank Pasquale's work quite well. So I, there were two questions that I hope would frame the conversation today that uh, relate to the, the project themes. Sorry, just I forgot that I had this slide in the presentation. Um, so even though quantified self, the focus is on kind of self-improvement and self-understanding, it obviously ties into debates around the surveillance society, and this is a terminology that was invented by a guy called Steve Mann, who actually might be the originator of this kind of quantified self ethos or ideology. He calls himself the world's first cyborg. He wears this kind of implant in his, around his eye that tracks all his movements every day. Um, so the creation of an uber-valence society where everybody is surveilling everybody else. So that might be one consequence of this kind of quantified self movement. But anyway, the two questions for the conversation today are, how do tracking and surveillance technologies affect our self-understanding? And then how do they affect how we are governed? And by governed, I, mean, I take that very broadly to being governed by the state, by our employers, by our friends, and by ourselves as well. So self-governance is involved in this process too. So what we're going to do is explore these two questions in four main domains. So we have the quantified self at play. It'll be a talk from Dr. Jane Walsh from NUI Galway. Then we'll look at the quantified self in work. It'll be Phoebe Moore from Middlesex. Then the quantified self in love. That'll be a presentation from me about quantification in intimate relationships. And then finally, from John Morrison, we'll have a talk about uh, the quantified self as citizen, the consequences of this for political and public life. So that's the format for the rest of the day. The first session this morning is going to be presentations from Jane Walsh and uh, Phoebe Moore. And Jane is the first up. All right, thanks. <laughs>